Hi, I'm Dan McDermott. This is a pilot for a new kind of hangout. I'm, I'm going to call it Top of the Hour Hangout, although we're running late, so it's not really the top of the hour, but you get the idea. Hangouts can go on for quite a while and cover a lot of ground. Often there will be a topic list, but it can kind of be a hassle to locate the start of the discussion that you're interested in because you usually aren't told where in the video that part begins. So, by starting at the top of the hour, I can easily post in the comments the time mark and the the time mark and the topic title so folks can hone in on that portion of the show. In theory, we're having some difficulties making it work. I have a list of topics to guide us, but we're certainly flexible. The point here is for all of us to have a fun time and hopefully learn something, especially when it is a point of view that we haven't yet considered. So here we go with the very first top of the hour hangout on the news. First up, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that Dr. Dre is planning to take a holographic version of Tupac Shakur on tour soon. Created in part by movie director James Cameron's visual production company Digital Domain, Tupac 2.0 made his debut performance over the weekend at the Coachella Valley Music and Arts Festival in Indio, California. According to the Los Angeles Times, the capacity crowd reportedly went silent with shock when Shakur appeared to rise from the stage, shout a profanity-filled version of What's Up Coachella, and then join headliners Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre for two songs. Personally, it kind of freaked me out a bit, but I thought it was awesome, and I've, uh, I've watched it about five times. This sort of thing isn't new. We all remember watching Natalie Cole singing alongside her deceased father. A Japanese hologram has been singing with a live band and charting hits since 2010. And then there was the unfortunate holographic appearance of Will I Am on CNN's election night coverage in 2008. No, we won't go there. Apparently, Shakur's mother saw the performance and thought it was absolutely fantastic. But uh, what do you think? I'll start with Anthony Clauser, who's in Rochester, New York. Um, Anthony, uh, is this the beginning of a wave of holographic concert appearances, do you think? You know, I think if they can do it, right? Um, you mentioned um, the 2010 um, CNN elections where they tried to do what they were calling a hologram, which, I mean, first of all, that was nothing like a hologram. This was a lot closer, if not a hologram. Um, but if they can do it well, which they did a pretty good job of, you know, making it look like he was actually there, you know, in three dimensions as opposed to like on CNN where it was only in, you know, you know straight on. Um, the only issue that I saw with this hologram performance of Tupac is sometimes he would he would float across the stage like he was on a uh, treadmill or something. Um, so I think they need to get down, you know, his movement, the hologram's movement a little bit better. But um, I think it's an interesting concept. Um, Harold, it's it's a lot. I mean, uh, imagine if um, you could be in multiple places, uh, you know, like, like Times Square. I mean, what if they could have people in different venues or um of course the posthumous performances like this uh i i just think it's fascinating and, and i don't know if you've seen that video of the japanese um anime uh artist and and um it started out as as a just a, i guess a cartoon and then they recorded songs and with this computerized voice so it's fascinating i mean i guess in a way she lives because she is completely a computer creation it's not uh old footage of uh you know an artist who's died and her voice is computer generated so it's it's almost like it's it is a live concert and the band is live with it but i just we were all shocked and i thought it was almost like an april fool's joke but this is um really crazy isn't it they've really come a long way uh since unforgettable with with nat king cole and uh and um, his daughter doing that performance. What, what were your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, it, you, you also have all those commercials where they have Lucy and Desi talking, you know, and, and things they put on there. But what, what's really everybody's talking about is what if, they, what if they get Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley, what about the copyright rules? What, what, how does this work? Do they have to pay Michael Jackson, anybody who's dead? Who do they pay if they make these people up and have them do that? That's the big talk uh, on all this about is is uh, how they're going to handle the money wise for making up these people and showing them. Well, don't all these people have um, uh, estates? I know that Michael Jackson definitely has an estate, uh, and uh, in this case, they actually asked the mother and said, you know, can we do this? And and they got, or I guess she liked it or whatever, but um, I guess she's in control of his estate. So that's an interesting thing. I just, I don't know. I mean, would you go, if you think of your favorite artist, like let's say you're a huge Beatles fan and just almost have a religious zeal 
as ironic as it might be, for John Lennon. And um, if you could go to a John Lennon concert where he was on the stage with a band, and uh, I mean, it's fake, but it's, it's sort of like going to a movie, right, Anthony? Um, you know when you, when you go to a movie, it's not real, but you, uh, you can still suspend reality, and it's like being there. Um, right. So, isn't, I mean, it, it's entertainment after all, isn't it? Yeah, it could perpetuate um, the image that, El, that Elvis is still alive. Well, you know, you know I, according I, to The Onion, he still <laughs> is. Go ahead, Anthony. <laughs> I think I think that you know if you go to a concert and say that you're you know seeing you know you know some band that is alive and is performing you know in front of you like physically in front of you, um, and then they decide that they want to bring on someone that can't be there, or someone that is a uh, well I guess if you're dead you can't be there but if you know for whatever reason they can't be there but you know the band wants them you know their presence um, as long as it's you know. At least at this state in the game, you know, um, with um, I'm sure the technology will continue to advance. But at this point in the game, um, I think if it's a secondary thing that it's you know it is cool because you're right. You do go to you know the movie theater, and um, I think this is probably more realistic than watching um, a you know a movie on a flat screen, you know, in uh, 2D. I think it's cool. Um, like I said, I watched it five times, and it was uh, at first it, it creeped me out. It really did, and um, I was just what what the hell is going on? And uh, but it was just awesome because I've always liked his music. Um, I, you know, I like Snoop and Dre. You know, the whole uh, I'm surprisingly cool that way. Um, but I, I just thought it was awesome. And that great uh, what's a song? Um, I can't repeat hardly anything because it was all uh, um, picture perfect. Okay. I paint a perfect picture. What you know that that was just awesome. That beat going, it was fantastic. It was like he was on the stage, and it was kind of a low resolution video. And uh, I would have loved to have seen the live feed that was going on, which was so crystal clear and beautiful. So I think it was fantastic. Let me go to some viewer comments, and we'll go to, on to a second topic. Um, Jonathan uh, mm, Hebert. Uh, I apologize, Hebert. I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Holographic Tupac was a great idea. Uh, watch out for copycats. Uh, you know, Dre's going to be on, um, he's, uh, apparently, according to the Wall Street Journal, he's going to be uh, taking him on tour. Um, trotting him out like Puff Daddy did with Biggie um, on the big screen, but uh, in 3D. Uh, money's going to take over the uh, artistic and technical side of this great moment. Um, like all, you know, I mean, that's that's the game, right? That's the that's the point. Okay, so let's see here. We uh, the link just Google Tupac uh, hologram and, and you'll get it. But Tupac was um, also just a flat-out projection on a screen. The only difference between this and a movie screen is that it is a transparent Mylar screen. I'm not sure that's accurate, but maybe it is. Uh, and then um, a Vocaloid is an instrument created by Yamaha. That's, I think that's how they uh, create the voice for the Japanese hologram we were discussing. It was interesting because on, on Tupac, it was interesting because it, created, uh, it was created digitally, and the audio was pieced together from an old performance, um, if I understand it correctly. It's really fantastic. You should watch it. But it's not safe for work. There's lots of cussing in it. Like the uh, same concert at the same time in multiple different places, the implications of this are awesome. People could have a personal concert in their own home for the price on the projector. Uh, they already have this. You can go to a movie theater and watch live performances. <laughs> and then um, uh, I wanted to play me, but I cannot talk English. Okay. Uh, from Rung Siam. Well, hey, thanks uh, to all the folks watching on YouTube or on Justin. The the just okay, finally the Justin player came up, and uh, folks watching on Google Plus. Okay, so um, let's uh, move on to topic number two, and um, I'm going to post the second topic in the YouTube chat, and I'm also going to post it. Uh, Oleg has just joined us. Oleg, if you'll look at my profile at about 7:14 p.m., I list the three topics. I shared it with the caller circle, but I forgot to mention you guys to notify you. Um, so look for 7:14 p.m. on my profile. You'll see the three topics, and then I'm going to um, I'm my. This is really strange. This YouTube thing, um, I love it, but um, it has got it, it. It's odd to try to type. You've got to separate your links with spaces to make them work and take out the H. TTP and stuff like that. So, um, okay, let's go with uh, topic number two. 
Um, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that the Federal Communications Commission is looking into a complaint that Comcast is treating its own Xfinity content differently than content from other sources. In a Facebook post, Netflix CEA, CEO Reed Hastings said that when he watched a movie from Netflix or Hulu, Comcast deducted about one gigabyte from his quota of 250 gigabytes a month. In contrast, Hastings said that when someone watches that same movie from Comcast, from their own uh, Xfinity service, uh, streaming service, there is no quota deduction. From 10,000 feet in the air, this would appear to run contrary to the FCC's push for net neutrality, which is treating all content and content providers the same. In response, Comcast said that only um, about 1% of its users ever reach the quota and that the programming from Xfinity is delivered via its own Internet IP network, not the open web, thus the preferential treatment for Xfinity. Who's right? Uh, let me go back to uh, Anthony again um, while uh, uh, Oleg brushes up on this stuff and, and, and Harry gets ready to go. Um, okay, Anthony, is Comcast violating the FCC's policy on net neutrality and trying to stick it to its competitors? Or is Comcast simply making a fair call since Xfinity content is not delivered in the same way as a Netflix or a Hulu program? What do you think? You know, I think that from what I understand, I think strictly speaking that Comcast is operating within um, um, the rules as they are set. However, I don't think that Comcast is um, acting within good faith. Um, the problem you have with the way that it is set up right now, and um, I think it, it, we should establish that the FCC has um, attempted to make uh, more um, um, uh, pro-consumer um, net neutrality laws, and there have been you know multiple lawsuits by uh, the content creators um, blocking their attempts. But anyways, um, so Xfinity, that's what it's called, right? Um, comes over um, Comcast pipes, and um, so that's going to be cheaper than uh, you know content coming in to the you know servers and then being pumped out again. Um, I think the problem is that eventually you know Comcast would go you know hey you know Yahoo, you know if you give us your content directly, we are uh, well, you know we won't you know count your um, the users um, bandwidth against the, the users, so they'd be uh, more compelled to go to you know Yahoo to do the searches instead of Google, and I think that's where you um, get into the dangers. But uh, yes, I think Comcast is operating within the rules, but no, I don't think that they're operating within the um, uh, good faith of what the FCC wants. I think it clearly. I mean, they can make an argument. Uh, both sides can. But let, let's uh, let me go to Oleg, and let's carry this argument to its logical conclusion. Couldn't Comcast, if, if what there's, you know, if, if right now they're saying that their Xfinity content is over their private IP network, not the open web, so it, they don't take that away from your quota. But if it's if you're watching that same show on Hulu or Netflix, they do take it away from your quota, which is about 250 gigabytes a month. And uh, one movie is roughly a gigabyte, according to uh, uh, Hastings. Uh, it varies depending on your bandwidth and all that. So uh, let me ask you this, Oleg. Let's let let's carry this on. Couldn't Comcast move NBC's product? Comcast owns NBC Universal. Couldn't Comcast move NBC's production and delivery to their home office and say the same thing? We deliver NBC.com shows through our own network, so we won't deduct from your quota any shows you watch from NBC.com. But ABC and CBS programming comes in over the open web, so those sources will impact your quota. Would that be fair? That sounds exact. I mean, they could absolutely do that, correct? Yeah, they could absolutely, and it would be just as unfair as what they're doing here. I think. I mean, it should. I mean, this whole idea with them having their own pipes and everything else. I mean, that I, I personally think it's the wrong approach to the thing. I mean, it, it, it for consumers is definitely not in the interest of consumers. And it's also not a very fair competition because if you look at other cable companies or, you know, if you take Verizon or anybody else, you know, they may not be in position based on current situation to have the same pipes. So they get penalized basically for uh, not having major infrastructure where they invested what Comcast invested over time and companies bought everything else. 
So yeah, I, I, my personal feeling, and that's just my personal feeling, is that I don't think it's fair that they're doing it this way. And I think it should be an equal playing field for all the companies to use the internet as, you know, if it's cheaper for them to have their pipes, that's great. But I think everybody should be charging the same kind of approach or using the same approach, in my view. Um, Harold, let me go to you and, and say, here's, here's the way I see it. In general, we want competition. We want companies to make money for their shareholders. Uh, if a company buys another company and they can do things more efficiently or whatever, that, that's great. You know, uh, people should have the right to do that. The difference here is, uh, like with the NBC thing, um, when Comcast bought NBC, a lot of the concern was these television stations get, there, there are only so many, there's so, only so much spectrum out there for these broadcast television stations. There's, um, it, they get their licenses free. They have a maintenance fee, but, but it's a few thousand dollars, and, and it's worth millions and millions of dollars. So they get to broadcast for free over the air, um, and there's only a few allowed per area. So in that case, the government steps in, just like with electric utilities. The government can regulate electric utilities because it just doesn't make any sense for multiple companies to run electrical cables to your house. It's too expensive. So in the cases where you have a de facto monopoly or you know, a semi-monopoly, like in broadcast television, then um, they do regulate things like this. Thus, uh, the concerns about the purchase of NBC. Well, um, I, I see their point. I see Comcast's point, and I see Reed Hastings' point. It's not fair because he's discriminated against. And I see mm -hmm. Comcast's point. Well, it's 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 not over the open web. It's our own private network, so it doesn't affect their quota. And they said, to be fair, they said only 1% or, or, or less of the people are affected by the quota. What are your thoughts on this, Harold Carey? Well, it kind of... It kind of reminds me of the situation when, when the Internet first started up, it was owned by the government. And then Sprint and MCI bought the Internet backbone from the government. And so they charged people for using that backbone. Now, who owns this backbone? If, if Compass puts out a lot of money for this stuff, they're just trying to recoup their money. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, it's interesting, but I, I, I see both sides. It it. it, it Sucks for Netflix, but I see their point. And then uh, Joshua Hughes, who's watching, and the Google player, he's uh, he's saying FCC gets in, uh, or he says we all just need to start uh, getting our internet from someone other than our cable company, if that's possible. The problem is that you still can't beat, um, you know, uh, fiber or, or copper wire to your house. Uh, anyone who's, uh, you know, compared streaming video or trying to use um, voice over IP over a Wi-Fi connection or any kind of wireless solution versus, uh, you know, hardwired Ethernet cable uh, can tell you that. So we'll see how this uh, progresses. But um, no, no, there's definitely some other choices. I mean, you have satellite. I have a, you know, one of my clients is a resort in Idaho, and they have a bunch of different kind of like uh, cottage homes. Uh, and, you know, they use satellite internet provider, and it actually works fairly well. So, I mean, there's definitely other choices. It's just... Those are the main big players, and that's why you can't just go and, you know, it's not like you have hundreds of people you can buy internet from. There's really usually a handful of those, if at that, depending which area you're in. So, you know, it's nice to say that it would be nice to just forget the cable companies. It's not realistic for, for a lot of people because they don't have anything else. So either they go True. dial up or they go with cable. And it's so It's a big deal, and we've said before, I feel horrible for these builders who have built these homes. Um, they can't sell them because they're in a dial-up only area. I mean, in, right. in this day and age, it's can you imagine you own six houses, uh, you bought the land, you know, you inherited the land, you know, 20 years ago, and you built these houses, and you're trying to move them, and um, and without internet, I wouldn't even consider moving. But uh, right. Comcast, but, I dial-up is also basically it's almost it's a little bit better than nothing, but it's not that much better in today's world. Yeah, in terms of having dial-up. It's interesting. Yeah, it's really, it's really nice where, where I live here in Spring. Uh, I just moved from Springville, Utah. I'm up in Idaho now. But we put in a fiber optic. We were the only city in the United States that, that had the whole city wired for fiber optic. Mm -hmm. And now everybody in the city gets 100 megabit connections yeah, fiber no optic for yeah, the whole city. Incredible. Okay, let me move on. Um, uh, okay, uh, third topic here. Wired is reporting that the... Uh, uh, well, they had a good story about it. Um, we heard it from multiple sources. Uh, Wired is uh, saying that the Supreme Court has agreed to decide the global reach of U.S. copyright law. Now, this is really interesting. 
Um, it's it, it's uh, a case testing whether um, an overseas purchaser of a copyrighted work may resell it in the United States without the copyright holder's permission. The justices will hear the case, which considers the first sale doctrine. In its next term, it's expected to set a nationwide standard. Federal circuit courts of appeals are split on the issue. The first sale doctrine dates to common law and was first codified in the United States in 1908. The idea is that if you legally purchase a creative work, like a book or a movie, you have a right to resell it later. Used bookstores and video rental kiosks are possible because of this principle. In the United States, the law states that when a book or a DVD is resold or rented, there is no new copy being produced, so no additional royalties are required. But in some other countries, including uh, and also in the European Union, there is no such principle, and an artist is entitled to a royalty each time the work is transferred. In a previous Supreme Court case, Costco was sued by a watch manufacturer for selling their products without authorization. Costco bought Omega watches overseas through what's called the gray market and sold them in its stores. Omega sued because the watch's unique design was copyrighted. The Ninth Circuit Court ruled against Costco, saying that because the watches were made in Switzerland, the first sale doctrine did not apply. When the case hit the Supreme Court in 2010, New Justice Elena Kagan recused herself since as Solicitor General she had advocated for Costco's position. For its part, Costco says that this policy would encourage manufacturers to leave the United States and move their factories out of the country so they could have complete control over distribution and redistribution. According to Wired, the case the justices decided to review Monday concerns textbook maker John Wiley and & Sons and California entrepreneur Supop Kurtzang, who was reselling textbooks on eBay purchased overseas to U.S.-based students without the publisher's consent. The publisher sued, and a New York federal jury agreed with John Wiley & Sons' position that the first sale doctrine did not apply and awarded $600,000 in damages for copyright infringement. So uh, what do you think about this? First, I'm going to go uh, this time to Harold. Um, should this uh, first sale doctrine apply no matter where the work was created? Uh, shouldn't Costco be allowed to sell those legally purchased watches, you know, wherever they see fit? It's, you just basically have to follow the, the copyright laws in the United States. Uh, if we're Otherwise, like you said, then your point that does everybody would just move out of the country and break all the laws if they weren't effective to everybody. Everybody follow the same law. So I would go with the, I would go with the, the company to, to follow the laws of, of their individual country if it's being sold in that country. Okay, let me go to um, Anthony. Um, Anthony, in Europe, the idea is that the creator of a work should be compensated every time someone gets that work for the first time. Does that seem fair, or is it one of these uh, crazy European ideas? What do you think, Anthony? I don't. I, I mean, you know, as an American, it seems well, you know, very foreign to me. You know, that European countries would charge, um, uh, you know, the consumer every single time that it traded hands. Um, the way it is right now in the United States. It, you know, the law is that you buy it once and then you can sell it, you know, um, and, uh, you know, not, um, you know, pay any, pay any more to the, you know, uh, company that originally created it because they're not, you know, putting any more effort into, into creating it. Um, I would say that, you know, Costco should be able to buy the watches over in Europe um, and bring them over at their expense to the United States and, um, you know, sell them as they see fit. The, what I'm going to do, so I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, yeah, let me go to Harold next because I know uh, Oleg will have the most entertaining response since um, he's always entertaining <laughs> and he lives in uh, Kirkland, Washington, where, of course, Costco is based. That's not the case yeah. they're dealing with. But uh, this is really an interesting question here because we respect foreign laws. Um, uh you know, in certain circumstances, depending on what the country is. But, Harold, what do you think about this? This is a really interesting uh, issue here. Well, the you know, the I, I'm a I'm a book producer myself, and so I'm writing books and stuff like this. And then, uh, if I produce a book, and and 
I'm really concerned about if I put this book out and I'm charging a certain amount of money, what if anybody who can make a copy of that book in another country can start selling it to my clients in here? Is that the particular case of the way it would work? If somebody just copies my book uh, that, I've, that I've printed and, and starts selling it to my same customers, because they're overseas, they won't get arrested for that? Well, it's not arrested. It's a civil matter. But the, yeah. the, the thing is this. It's, it's, um, you, know, you can go to a used bookstore. Because the whole notion is that the, the author of the book and the publishing company earns their money when they sell the book. John Grisham gets a, you know, his royalty and everyone gets paid. And then um, if you later decide you've read it and you want to give it to someone, you want to give it to your mom to read and recommend, or if you, uh, for whatever reason, you want to um, you know, transfer it, they're not pro you're not producing a second copy of the book. You're just giving the original to someone else. And so in the United States, that, that first sale doctrine means that you're allowed to do that. And that's how we can have a red book, a red box kiosk, a, a used bookstore, GameStop, things like that. But in Europe, the European Union, um, in certain cases, every time something is transferred, it has to, uh, you know, they, they have to um, compensate the copyright holders. So it is really interesting. Let me go to Oleg for the final thoughts on this issue. Um, you uh, just, just to give a disclaimer here, you're a Costco fan. You live in Kirkland, Washington, where Costco is based. And uh, you're probably not a big fan of uh, crazy European uh, laws, like uh, no used bookstores or, or however this impacts them over there, whatever the yeah. case may be. What are your uh, thoughts, I think, Oleg? Yeah, my, my thoughts are that you know each country has its own rules and its own way of how they handle business. Obviously, because we are such a um, connected and society now, then you wind up, I mean, in the old days, it wouldn't be that big of a deal, but now, because everything is connected, people do trade, you know, electronically and digitally and things like that, it, it kind of blurs the lines a little bit. But I still think that, you know, we have the laws of the United States, and in my view, that's, those are the laws that everybody in the United States should be adhering to. Now, when you're talking about being able to buy some, some of these watches on the gray market, um, are, are you talking about real stuff or are you talking about fake stuff? Were they real Omega ones? Oh, made this, by Omega? okay. In, in this case, they were real Omegas and they bought them overseas, but they were not an authorized distributor. And the way that Costco was sued, uh, let me, uh, Jeff, can you mute your mic for me, buddy? I'm sure, getting, I'm sorry. Uh, dogs and stuff barking. Okay. Um, the, what, what happened in the case of the Costco was Omega manufactures the watches and has a tightly controlled uh, distribution channel, like a lot of companies do. Mm -hmm. um, so, what Costco did is, and I've seen this other with like the, no, the fancy so how did glasses. Gray market people, if they were not authorized, how did they get these watches? No, they bought them uh, legally. They were legally purchased by distributors who secretly like bought a few extras and then sold, sold them to a middleman or whatever, and then they ended up and at those Costco. Sold to cost. Okay. Right. So they have you know a few eighteen wheelers full of pallets or whatever it is, right. and then um, Costco sold them, but the way that they got them. Uh, it's like the way they got Al Capone was was um, accounting stuff, you know, instead yeah, of murder. Absolutely. So the way they got him was the the image on the watch is copyrighted. It's a mm -hmm. unique design. So right. technically, they were selling a copyrighted item made in Europe where the uh, first sale doctrine doesn't apply. And mm -hmm. so Costco had to, I think, I guess it was, I, I forget what the judgment was. And that case was 4-4 because Elena Kagan had argued for Costco's position as solicitor general, so she couldn't vote on it in the Supreme Court or participate in it. So the uh, Ninth Circuit Court ruling was sustained just because of inaction by the Supreme Court because it was even. So my mm -hmm. guess is, in this new case, which is basically the exact same issue, she can weigh in, and she will probably rule a uh, vote to be the fifth person uh, to uh, say that the, the, that the first sale doctrine would apply in the United States regardless of the of the point of manufacture. Costco's big argument was all these companies are going to go overseas. These companies that are trying to tightly control distribution. Uh, imagine if um, if uh, a book publisher could locate the factory in, in London mm -hmm. and hire a bunch of folks in, over there to make the books and then ship them over here and it would be illegal to ever ever sell those books used. Can you imagine? Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's crazy. Yeah, it's totally ridiculous if that's the case. Okay, so um, hey guys, I, I appreciate it, and, and we're going to continue to hang out in just a moment. I'll close the uh, official recorded version of the show. Uh, great discussion. Uh, we'll have more like it. I'll close on this interesting story from the Pointer Institute about a television news legend. Walter Cronkite's first broadcast 
occasioned a fight that's still going on today. It ended in Cronkite inviting viewers to get the details of stories he'd reported in the next day's papers. Scott Pelley, from Pointer again, said Monday on the 50th anniversary of Cron uh, Walter Cronkite's first day as host of the evening edition of the 15-minute-long CBS News, an explosion broke out amongst the suits and management who were very upset that Walter was sending people to read newspapers instead of coming to him for the news. Cronkite crafted a compromise. He came up with an alternative sign-off, the one he'd use for the next 19 years. And that's the way it is. I'm Dan McDermott from Google Plus Week. Thanks to the panel, and thanks so much to you for watching and commenting. I'll see you in the comments, and we'll talk with you again very soon, right here on uh, Top of the Hour News. Thanks so much for watching.